The New York Giants are cooking with gas, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm going to tell you why coming up next on the Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family, your team every day. My name is Patricia Trena, and it is Saturday morning, the day after the New York Giants with a 21-19 win over the Carolina Panthers. And ladies and gentlemen, we have ourselves a football team. It's hard. I'm pinching myself here. It's so hard to believe, but we legitimately have ourselves a football team and a good football team at that. And I'm going to give you on today's program, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the takeaways, the good things that I saw last night. I have for you uh, bounce back performances that I want to talk about, as well as one performance in particular that I'm still a little concerned with. And then I want to give you an update on some of the key training camp battles and how I see them playing out after two preseason games with one more to go. So that is today's agenda. And uh, thank you for making us your first listen of the day or watching on YouTube, your first watch of today. And today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, we've got a lot to get to, so let's do that. All right, folks, we've got to start off with quarterback Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones had himself a night, played one series, Eight of nine, 69 yards, one five-yard touchdown pass to tight end Daniel Bellinger. He wasn't touched once. Great blocking up front, by the way, by the starting offensive line. Daniel Jones threw to six different receiving targets. Darren Waller had um, four of the targets. He caught three of the balls. He had one drop there uh, after getting walloped by Vaughn Bell. But uh, Darren Waller, three for 30. But again, just watching Daniel Jones operate, we're talking with precision. We're talking good decisions. Um, just he And he also had one uh, play in which he tucked the ball down and ran. Just an overall solid showing by Daniel Jones, folks. I mean, this guy, you know, a lot of people are still not sure if he's going to be the guy, you know, can they win with him? Folks, I do think they can win with Daniel Jones. He looked that good. Now, a lot of skeptics are going to say, well, it was just one series. Yeah, it was. How many more series do you need to see if you're the coaches? You know, you see this guy every day in practice, and he's looked pretty good. And he got out there, and he didn't do anything to, to you know, make you disbelieve in what he had um, shown during training camp. So Daniel Jones... I don't know if we'll see him next week against the Jets, but ladies and gentlemen, he is coming along beautifully. The confidence is there. The decision-making is there. He's playing smart ball, just a really solid performance. Yes, it was only one series, but it was a touchdown drive. And just the way he navigated that offense down the field, what more could you ask for? Seriously, what more could you ask for? Sure beats having a guy who's, putting the ball on the ground or turning it over in the air. Just a really, really solid game by Daniel Jones. All right, I mentioned Darren Waller. Three receptions out of four pass targets, 30 yards. The one that he dropped, he got hit. You know, I mean, he he really got hit hard, and the hit actually knocked the ball out of his grasp. But Darren Waller, you just watching him work his way down the, uh, the field and running his routes and everything, he draws a crowd, folks, and by drawing a crowd, that is going to open up so much for the offense around him, for the other receivers. So just really solid play by Darren Waller. Um, one thing I want to mention is the offensive line play. Now, the offensive line, I, I, one of the things I was kind of watching, was I was focused on Evan Neal, who I'm going to talk a little bit about in just a bit. Um 
but I've got to talk about the creative blocking that we saw from the offensive line. Now, most times you figure, okay, the ball is snapped. The linemen jump into their blocks, case, case closed, right? On Eric Gray's five-yard touchdown run, the Giants did something creative. What that something was is they had their two tackles release into the second level. So instead of hitting somebody, you know, at the point of attack, they released into the second level and they were able to really open up a wide path for Eric Gray. Eric Gray rambled in five yards untouched before, you know, the first contact was made and he came up with the touchdown. So it, it was just, you know, to, to see it to see the tackles release into the second level and Eric Gray be able to go five yards easily without being touched. And then, you know, he, the first contact just before he made it into the end zone, just, it may just sit up and say, wow, where has this been all our lives? Right. Certainly, you know, the last few coaching staffs, so you haven't seen that. So some creative blocking there that was really encouraging. You know, I mentioned Evan Neal. I know a lot of you were, Curious to see how Evan Neal would do um, after missing 12 days of practice with a concussion. I kept my eyes on Evan Neal for the majority of the time he was in there. I, I made it a point to put my binoculars on him. And folks, there was just really two things that I saw that, you know, I didn't really like from him. The first one is he tried to cut a guy low. I mean, he literally went down and tried to cut a guy at his ankles. And I was like, what are you doing, Evan? And of course, the guy just stepped over him. The other more blatant myth, miss that he had, what came on a stunt, all right? So Neil was lined up next to right guard Mark Lewinsky. There was a stunt that came in, and Neil totally whiffed. And afterwards in the locker room, um, I he was asked about that. I was in the, the little pile with him. And um, he basically said, I took a bad angle. But overall, he was very encouraged by his game. He did play a really good game, I thought. He, you know, he he looked a lot sharper than I can recall him seeing. Not bad considering that he uh, missed, like I said, 12 days of practice while dealing with that concussion that he had. So, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about Evan Neal coming up in the next segment when I do my bounce backs and concerns, but I had to give a shout out to him. Um, one other guy I want to, actually a couple of other guys I want to mention. Um on defense, Kayvon Thibodeau. Folks, you know, I, I mentioned this, um, I think, in the show last week when I talked about the second-year draft picks, you know, the class of 2022 and what we needed to see. Kayvon Thibodeau, I, I remember mentioning, we need to see him start taking over games. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, having gaudy stats every week. That doesn't mean necessarily having a sack every week. But this week in his limited snaps, Thibodeau took over the game. He had one tackle for a loss, one sack. He was drawing a ton of double teams. Folks, that's what you want to see from Kayvon Thibodeau. You know, football is a team game. If he's opening things up for other guys to make plays, that's all you can really ask for. And hey, if it ends up, uh, if a play ends up in his stat line, even better. The surprise of the night, Jordan Riley got a start, not at nose tackle, where he has been playing almost exclusively this summer, but at defensive end. And you know what? This young man, a seventh round draft pick, who admittedly I thought was going to be a, a you know a one-year project, given how he bounced around, boy, he has looked so good. All right. So Jordan Riley beat a single block. He forced uh, you know, a turnover on downs on that single block that he beat. He had a tackle for a loss. And um, I think he finished up with three tackles, faced a ton of double teams like, you know, you would expect him to when he moved inside and didn't give up ground. This kid is playing really, really well. Now, is there going to be a spot for him on the 53, given the veterans in front of him? I think you got to find a spot for him because, you know, the tape this kid's putting out there, solid. So I'm going to be curious to see if they do find a spot for him. Now, I don't necessarily think if he does make the 53, is he going to play ahead of the guys, you know, 
the Sean Robinson, the Raheem Nunes Roaches is. I don't know about that. But here's another thing he has in his favor, and that is health. You know, Nunes Roaches has dealt with some injuries this past uh, summer, or this summer, rather. Um, Robinson's still working his way back from the, the meniscus injury that he had um, that put him on pup. It is possible that Jordan Riley could have a bigger role than anybody anticipated. And, you know, when you think of Jordan Riley being a seventh round pick and Trey Hawkins being a sixth round pick and Hawkins got the start too, by the way, at cornerback, did Joe Shea knock this draft class out of the park or what? I mean, I know it's only preseason, but based on what we have seen, Joe Shea knocked this one out of the park. No question. All right. One other guy I want to mention just real quick, because we got a, our first look at him as a giant, Bobby Okereke. He was in for two series, seven tackles in two series. Wow. A lot of smart, quick reads, um, good feel for uh, the game, both uh, between the tackles and in space, instinctive. Bobby Okereke, if he's healthy, I would not be surprised if he goes on to have a 100 tackle season. So very, very encouraged by that. The Giants finally have themselves a legitimate inside linebacker, folks. I mean, you're going to hear me say this probably a lot, a legitimate inside linebacker, a legitimate quarterback, a legitimate this, a legitimate that. That's how encouraging the Giants were in jumping out. I think they jumped out to like a 21-3 lead over the Panthers. And that was over a course of, you know, the first team and the second team. So a lot of encouraging things to come out of last night's game. All right. Now coming up, I am going to talk about bounce back performances and one performance that I'm still a little concerned with. So that's go coming up right after this. Hey, giant fans, these days, every new potential hire could feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available, right? So that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. I've used LinkedIn Jobs myself to find aspiring writers and editors for the Giants Country site that I run over on SI's Fan Nation. And the process is not only super easy, but a big time saver. Simply add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. And simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize whom you'd like to interview and hire. So don't spend time sorting through endless resumes and dead end leads. Put LinkedIn jobs to work to you today for free by visiting linkedin.com slash locked on NFL terms and conditions apply. All right, giant fans, welcome back to the locked on giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Trainer, coming to you on a Saturday morning, the morning after the giants with a 21 19 preseason win over the Carolina Panthers folks. It's not about the score. It's not about the outcome of the game. It's about the performances. And there was a lot to like, about what we saw last night in the Giants game against the Panthers. And on this segment, I want to talk about some bounce back performances and one performance in particular that I'm still a little concerned with this player and what I've seen from him because it's just it just looks like he's not quite moving the way I thought he might move. But let's talk about the good stuff first, the bounce backs. Starting with receiver Bryce Ford Wheaton. Now, last week, Bryce Ford Wheaton, he had a drop. He, he slipped on a, on a pass play. And I thought, oh, my gosh, practice squad, if he's lucky. This week, folks, Bryce Ford Wheaton came up with two very difficult catches, including one contested catch. He got open a lot more than so than he did last week. And he contributed on special teams. And I didn't see the TV broadcast, but uh, I know a couple of my colleagues were watching it. And one of them um, happened to see that Joe Shane was on. And he, Joe Shane mentioned special teams for Bryce Ford Wheaton. You know, that that could be his ticket to the uh, to the 53-man roster. And, you know, 
I mentioned that as a possibility actually way back when, when we were doing initial, you know, roster projections and whatnot. I mentioned that, you know, could the Giants conceivably keep Bryce Ward Wheaton as like a seventh receiver on the depth chart if he could give them something on special teams? Well, he did give them stuff on special teams. Look good there. And there's a possibility now, given his size and skill set, that maybe he becomes that guy that uh, they're looking for. So Bryce Ford Wheaton definitely with a bounce back performance this week. All right. Another guy with a bounce back performance. Now, not necessarily from the week before, but from last year. And I talked about him in the last segment, Evan Neal. All right. Uh, I mentioned Evan Neal had a couple of plays that I didn't like, but overall, ladies and gentlemen, he had a solid showing good mobility. His run blocking was a little bit of hit and miss, but the, the pass blocking was a lot better. He looked a lot more comfortable. All right. I think I had mentioned on another show that there were times when I just watched him and it looked like he was still kind of like fidgeting a little bit and trying to find a comfort level with his stance. That looked like he had cleaned it up, like he had found something. Um, the one thing I do see when I was watching him, and again, I mentioned that I put my binoculars on him nearly exclusive while he was in there, is sometimes on the pass block, he'll pull his um, his left hand back before, you know, the snap. And then before he pulls his, you know, before he starts to retreat. So that didn't get called, but there's something that, you know, I, I'm, I'm watching. And I'm going to see if I can, you know, ask about that if that's a big deal or something, but I did notice he like kind of pulls his hand back before the snap, like, you know, like a momentum thing, almost like he's shifting into reverse um, when he goes to pass block. But Evan Neal, considering the struggles he had last year, the inconsistencies, I thought he looked um, very promising in his um, first half of play. He played basically the entire first half at right tackle. Um, so encouraging performance there. Now, this one's going to surprise a lot of you because I know a lot of you wanted to see this guy launched into space after last week's performance, but Corey Cunningham had a better showing this week. He played um, exclusively at right tackle in the second half. Zero pressures. He stayed on his feet. His run blocking was decent. And, you know, it was a solid performance. Now, do I think Corey Cunningham is going to make the roster? I don't know about that, folks. Again, I still say if Tyree Phillips isn't, you know, the guy, and I know Tyree Phillips didn't play because he's injured, so hopefully he gets back. I think he becomes the swing tackle, but Corey Cunningham, I think it's fair to say that he redeemed himself with a decent performance last night. So uh, whether it's an, enough to make the team, that remains to be seen. That I'm not so sure about, but you know, there's still one more week of football left, and it's against the Jets, and the Jets have a pretty good team. So we'll see how Corey Cunningham does in his opportunities against the Jets. All right, now I've got to give you one guy that I'm a little concerned about because I'm just not seeing um, enough progress, at least in my eyes. Now the coaches might feel differently, but Joshua Azudu at left guard, what I saw – Clumsy feet and balance issues continue. He's more of a leaner than a hitter. He's leaning into his blocks as opposed to punching. Um, just overall inconsistent. Izudu got snaps at left guard. Um, you know, the Giants were doing that rotation again. And I can't honestly say that I was like, okay, this competition got interesting. So, you know, to be fair to Azudu, this is still kind of like his rookie year because he didn't miss most of his rookie year last year. And when he's on point, he's very good. He can move guys out of the way. Um, he could be a brick wall, but too much inconsistency for my taste from Joshua Azudu. So, you know, I, I'd like to say there's still a lot of time left, but, you know, we're, we're starting to run out. We're at, past the midway point of um, – of uh, August. Um, as I record, this is August 19th, and I believe the cuts are in 10 days, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll have to see how Joshua Zudu fares in these remaining camp practices and against the Jets. But um, overall, 
inconsistent and I'm a little concerned with him and uh, his development. I think he makes the team, but still needs a lot of work in his game. All right, coming up next, folks, I'm going to give you an update on the competition battles as I see them. So don't go anywhere. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I'm Patricia Chena. And coming up this week on the Locked on Giants podcast, I'm going to have David Turner, who's a former NFL scout. He's going to be on the show with me. And we're going to kind of do an um, an overview of what we've seen so far in two preseason games. There's a lot to like. You know, I was texting with David this morning. There's a lot that he has seen that he's liked. He has some concerns. We're going to talk about that and just kind of, you know, as we spin ahead towards the start of the regular season. But overall, folks, I think we can all agree a lot of stuff that the Giants have shown that we can get excited about. So now in this segment, let's talk about some competition updates. And I'm going to start with left guard. Now, the Giants have been doing the rotation. Um, again, I believe that's to give guys opportunities to, to test them out, give them snaps. You saw Ben Bredesen at left guard. You saw Joshua Zudu at left guard, you know, with the ones. Folks, I think Ben Bredesen's going to be the left guard. Now, would they consider rotating with a Zudu to continue getting him snaps because of the inconsistencies that I pointed out, you know, in the last segment? It's possible, but at some point, I think you've got to say, okay, this is going to be my group. This is going to be my starting five. I don't think they want to go with uh, a rotation, but it's possible that we might see it maybe in some cleanup roles or maybe against, you know, certain opponents. But uh, Bredesen, I think, has won that starting left guard job. I'd be shocked if he didn't. Mark Lewinsky, I think, has won the starting right guard job. You know, again, we saw rotations in there with Bredesen playing there. And I keep saying it, folks. I think the reason why they did so was to give Bredesen snaps at positions that maybe he didn't have a lot of experience at. So right guard, playing a little bit at center. This is in case there's an injury. You know, better to prepare than to get caught, you know, blindsided, if you will, if there's an injury, now all of a sudden you don't have a guy who can play for you at that position. All right. Jason Pinnock has won the strong safety job. I think we can call him that one. Um, I mentioned Bryce Ford Wheaton as a comeback player or a bounce back player. I wouldn't be stunned if he maybe gets that last receiver spot. So now obviously the thing we're going to watch for in the coming week, if um, Wandale Robinson comes off a pup because if he comes off a pup he's going to get a spot so in terms of the receivers you figure Hodgins Slayton Paris Campbell Jalen Hyatt that's four all right I think Sterling Shepard will make it is five I think uh Cole Beasley will will probably make it six Bryce Ford Wheaton could be seven. And I'm hesitating here because I feel like I'm missing somebody, but we could see seven receivers. And that could be the seven that we see. Now, whether it stays with seven, that remains to be seen because, like I said, the 53 man roster is an initial 53 man roster, is not set in stone. So we'll have to see how it plays out. But Bryce Ford Wheaton, if he can give them stuff, you know, on special teams, which he did last night, he has a chance of making it. Now I'm going to give you a surprise pick here that, you know, a guy that I didn't think would make it, but I think was helped himself the last couple of weeks because he has been, in my opinion, at any rate, the best player at his position to play in the games. And that is running back Deshaun Corbin. Corbin right now is in a competition with uh, Gary Brightwell, who uh, missed last night's game because of injuries. Now, here's the thing with Corbin. All right, now, disclaimer, actually. Saquon Barkley did not play last night. He has not played in any preseason games, and we don't expect to see him in any preseason games. So when I say just Sean Corbin has been the best running back on the field in the games for the Giants this summer, 
take that into consideration that Saquon has not played. All right. So what have we seen from Deshaun Corbin? Speed. All right. Good hands in the passing game. He has managed to push to get to the first down marker. Um, his he had a 17 yard run where he had good bursts and you know good vision. Unfortunately, that run was negated by a holding penalty. Um, he has consistently made it to the second level in both games. Probably the only running back um, to play that you could honestly say has done that on a consistent basis without any you know big problems. Um, he has broken tackles and he has shown patience in his running. All right. So the Giants may have something there. And here's the benefit also for just Sean Corbin. He can play special teams. Now, you know, Gary Brightwell, I mentioned, I think he is the competition for just Sean Corbin for that last spot at running back. Gary Brightwell, no longer the kick returner. All right, that job looks like it's going to Eric Gray. So if you can't give, you know, snaps on special teams and, you know, could Brightwell participate on the coverage teams and stuff like that? Yes, he could. But I just get the feeling now that just Sean Corbin could edge Gary Brightwell off the roster. So in terms of running backs, Saquon, Matt Breida, Eric Gray, and I could see Deshaun Corbin as that fourth guy. So something to keep an eye on. Uh, but Deshaun Corbin quietly has had himself a decent summer and an impressive showing now in two preseason games. So that's my surprise pick on um, in terms of the uh, position battles. The inside linebacker spot, I still think, Right now, Michael McFadden's job to lose. I think, although I I see him and Darian Beavers potentially rotating. Now, for those who missed the news, the Giants did have Anthony Barr in for a look. There was no signing imminent, so might they sign him? I don't know, but um, I I think they could conceivably stick with the young guys because you know Anthony Barr, you, you know. He'd be a good addition. He's maybe not the same guy he was when he was making the Pro Bowl four, four years in a row. But um, I think the Giants are going to rotate those two young inside linebackers there, Beavers and Micah McFadden. And I think McFadden is definitely in the lead. You know, Wink Martindale said that. And there was nothing that he showed last night that I think hurt his standing, if you will. So that's position, you know, we'll see what the thrilling conclusion is at that position, but that's how I kind of see it trending. All right, Giant fans, that's going to do it for this edition of the Locked on Giants podcast. Thank you again for your patience while I got this done early in the morning. And uh, but keep it here all week long. We're going to have David Turner on the show. I'm working on a couple of other guests to come on the show for this week because I know some of you have said, hey, you haven't had guests on in a while. Well, I actually have, but we'll see if we can get some more guests on because I know you guys like like it when I bring new voices on. And we'll just keep bringing you all you need to know about the New York Giants. So thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I'll see you on Monday.